So I just want to thank everybody that attended this meeting. Uh, I I want uh, Simon maybe uh, you introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah. And then yeah, we'll uh, we go with the presentation. So the floor is yours. Okay. And thank I, you very I much. I want to mention that uh, the, the meeting was supposed to be inside, but uh, Simon is uh, uh, PCR positive. Uh, yes. But hopefully he's uh, he's uh, healthy enough uh, to to do the presentation. So we are happy. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm actually feeling fine. I have been for several days, but unfortunately they, I, I couldn't take the plane uh, and I couldn't take the train either. So, uh, um, and I didn't want to infect anybody anyway. So, um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm very happy to be talking to you today. Um, uh, I've known Amir for several years now, but we've got this collaboration and, and at the end I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I hope we're going to be able to do uh, with this collaboration between the Circo and IMEC. So, uh, yeah, I work for the CNRS, a uh, French research organization. Um, I, most of my career, I've been really trying to look at ways of using biology as a source of inspiration for AI, actually. Um, and I'm going to tell you two stories, really. One is uh, an old one, which is um, the idea that, uh, well, um, Fast visual processing in, in our brains, for instance, is so fast that it really has to be a feed forward pass. And I've been asking, uh, arguing for that in for about 30 years. Uh, it's basically uh, on, the back, uh, on, on the basis of temporal constraints. Uh, there's just simply not enough time to, to, um, to do much more than a feed forward pass. <laughs> it turns out that the state of the art in artificial vision is now effectively using that uh, with these deep deep learning trained uh, convolutional neural networks. They're getting superhuman performance, by the way, uh, really now. Um, so you might say, oh, well, problem solved. Uh, uh, AI is just simply um, um, aligned with, with human vision, if you like. But actually, there's a lot missing, uh, and it, that's my other big question. It's the, it's the role of spikes, the fact that real neurons don't send floating point numbers, they send spikes, and that changes the way you code information. Uh, it also changes the way you learn information. And what I'm going to argue is that if you think spikes, uh, very and particularly very sparsely activated uh, spiking neural networks, this can open up the possibility of doing much, much more efficient uh, architectures. And I will argue that spikes are actually vital if you want to make energy efficient AI systems. So just to recap a little, very rapidly on you know, my what's been my life work, really, it's uh, trying to work out what vision can do. It, I see it as activation of visual memory. I hope, by the way, that that the um, Internet isn't too bad. That should have been about two, fra two frames a second. And hopefully your visual systems will have done the job. So the big question is, how does the brain do this recognition, activating memories that we've stored? And can we build artificial systems that could do the same thing? Now, I've been arguing from on the basis of the speed of processing that it has to be basically a feed forward uh, pass. Um, this actually get, dates back to um, work in the 1970s by people like Molly Potter, who showed that you could sh send, send, show images about 10 frames per second and the brain can process them fine. So I don't know how well this will work, but this is 10 frames a second, at least on my computer. I don't know what it happens at the other end. Those are just pictures of animals. And, and you probably um, saw them all. I don't know whether you saw 10 images per second, but anyway, you get the idea. And um, if you throw in an odd man out, like in that one, I don't know whether you saw the Mona Lisa, but it, it often will just pop out, as will in this sequence. Hopefully, you may have seen the Statue of Liberty or in this last one. Um, there was a picture of the uh, Mickey Mouse, assuming that the um, the internet is fast enough. Uh, what this is showing that is the brain really does a very good job, even when you're not you're not you don't know what to look for. And we we did some. Um, uh, I think uh, my biggest hit in terms of publications was this paper from 1996, where we just flashed images for 20 milliseconds and got people to say whether there's an animal present. Uh, you know, the, the image was a completely mix there were all sorts of different types of animals different types of sizes and the task was simply release a button if you see an animal and we got reaction times here which 
around 400 milliseconds, but sometimes they could be down to 250, 280 milliseconds, something like that. But at the same time, we were measuring the event-related potentials, just sticking an electrode on the, on the skin here. And you can see here the average response to all the targets, the images with animals, and all the distractors. And you can see that these two curves split at 150 milliseconds. This blue curve is the difference between the two very robust. It happens essentially for any image. And it allowed us to conclude that even when you don't know what you're looking for, scene processing only takes 150 milliseconds at most. It turns out it actually is even faster than that. We had another task called a saccadic cho choice task, where um, uh, we we have two images flash up, uh, one on the left, one on the right, and you have to saccade to the side where the, where the human face uh, and this, you can probably tell that this is actually an incredibly easy task to do. The, the, we do it automatically, essentially. And, and, and when we measured the reaction times, it turns out, well, animals are pretty fast, but faces are ludicrously fast. They, the first saccades coming in at 100 milliseconds. That's really, really fast. And um, I'd want to show you our latest um, uh, amazing task. It's called, we call it face zapping, where basically you get to, you get shown a, a very complicated large image um, uh, and we're tracking your eye and there's a pa face pasted somewhere. You move your eye to the face and as soon as you get there, the eye tracker picks that up and it presents a new image with a new face and then you have to go there and then you keep doing this 500 times and you measure how long it takes to do all, all 500. Well, it turns out you can get up to six saccades in a second, even though you don't know what you're looking for. This is actually a, this is a video. Uh, again, I'm not sure how well this is going to uh, uh, work at the, your end, but you can see the, the eye just, just uh, zapping around. Um, now, um, almost certainly you won't have seen everything very well here, but I can go back to the beginning and say, okay, we start off at the center and and here we are here the the face is over off to the right there i don't know whether you can see it there we go first okay now it's over to the left now it's over to the right now it's over to the right down a bit this is i like this one this is the face is up here we actually make life really hard by by adjusting the contrast to match whatever it is that we're where we're pasting things in and the eye went in the right direction. It's slightly undershot. You had to make a correction. You can see this. This is just stunning because uh, 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 we don't know. There's no clue about where the face is going to be. And we really have not made life easy for people. So, well, just backtracking over, you know, in 1989, I'd already made the point that, um, well, we knew that neurons in the infratemporal cortex of the monkey, this is Dave Perrett's work, fire about 100 milliseconds after an image comes on. And um, if you sort of do a you know, back of the envelope calculation, these neurons are about 10, 10, 10 uh, synapses away from the photoreceptors in, in the retina. So if you can get through 100 milliseconds in 10 layers, uh, 10 layers in 100 milliseconds, about 10 milliseconds per layer, we know that neurons rarely go above around 100 spikes per second, which basically means that you don't really have any time to come back and, and do loops. And you're basically doing this as one spike per neuron which rules out actually the, the classic idea that we're using rate coding. If you've only got one spike, you can't measure the rate properly. So this, I think, was uh, uh, already signs that there was something wrong with the classic view that is all rate coding. And this is a sort of a, a sort of figure for, for, um, um, for uh, showing the sort of uh, thing that you get in, in, in monkeys, where you've got this wave of spikes going through the visual system. And you literally only have a few milliseconds at each uh, processing stage. There's actually somebody turning some papers at the moment, that, that, which is coming through. I don't know whether it's possible to cut your microphone. Anyway, um, so this, um, you know, th this was already pointing towards a, a very robust way of, of doing uh, processing with just a, basically a feedboard pass and very few spikes per neurons. Big question, could you get an artificial system to do the same thing? Well, um, for much of my career, I would have said no way. Um, uh, the fact is that human, uh, the human brain, if you think about it, it, we've got 86 billion neurons, 16 billion of them in the cortex. We've got about 4 billion of them in the visual system. And their sort of clocks rate, if you like, is about one kilohertz. So you can send a, a, a spike, a pulses that last about a millisecond. One of the real killer problems is that the 
uh, conduction velocity of the neurons is really, really slow. It's about one to two meters per second, which is which is catastrophic. You imagine trying to build a chip where the information could only travel at one meter per second. You'd say no way. But this actually does work, and it only uses about 20 watts. We can compare that with you know latest uh, hardware like the NVIDIA uh, GPUs. 36 teraflops, you've got thousands of cores and billions of transistors, lots of memory, gets really hot relative to the brain. And, you know, this is pretty pricey uh, stuff. But you can ask the question, how do they compare? Can you do vision with one of these things? And as I say, um, for a long time, I, you know, I thought there was no way. But then there's this thing called the ImageNet Challenge, where they basically do millions of training images with lots of labels. You train up the system on new images, and then you uh, you get tested with a thousand possible le levels uh, labels. Well, I was at the European Conference on Computer Vision with Jan Lacan actually in 2012, and uh, and uh, the, the place was buzzing because the state of the art in in computer vision had been beaten by a simple feed forward convolutional neural network that had been trained with backprop. It was uh, Jeff Hinton and his two students at the University of Tron Toronto, and that paper has now been cited over 100,000 times, absolutely phenomenal. But they were using the most simple architecture you can imagine. It's just a feed-forward network with, with a bunch of convolutional layers, a couple of fully connected layers, and an output layer. And they gave you the architecture. There's no feedback, no horizontal connections at all. It just straight run and pass uh, through the system. They tell you what the, the uh, filters on the first layer are. It gets a bit more complicated afterwards. But it, the point is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a relatively small number of neurons, 650,000 neurons, 60 million parameters to tune, which corresponds to 630 million synapses. But this this system, which you know many people call AlexNet, because it's the, the the main developer was Alex Krzyzewski. Well, he sent me some just pictures of the sort of things that it does, because I'd been interested in finding animals. Uh, and this is just um, for each image the sort of ground truth, and then the five highest activation I output. That someone was saying Kyunj, Kyunj. Were you? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a bit of interference there. Um, um, anyway, so the um, the point is that this this is really working very well. The, the the top few, the couple of I've actually ranked these according to how well the system's doing, and you know it gets a bit bit bad at the bottom. This is a spider monkey, uh, and the system said it's a howler monkey, but uh, it was um, you know it's still doing very well. And this is my favourite. The the correct answer is cherry, and the system said a dalmatian dog. Well, that's a pretty good guess as well. I mean, I was just completely floored by this. I said, you know, this this is amazing. And an and image minute performance, starting with 2020, 2012, when the very first, when AlexNet came out, it's just got better and better. So these, these are all, this is human performance. A courageous guy who tried training himself to do the same problem. He got about 94% correct, but now we're way above that. Um, and so we've got superhuman performance starting in 2015. And you know this is the top five accuracy now. We're at ninety nine point zero five percent, way better than a human. And and if you uh, ask for top one percent, in other words, is your best bet uh, the actual ground truth thing? And it, we're now at ninety point nine five percent. So in a sense, you could say that problem has been solved. I mean, I can I can retire. But the problem is the way that these systems learn. Um, these neural networks are trained with deep learning. Uh, they're certainly the state of the art, but they're using floating point numbers to con code the neural ac ac activation levels and the connection strengths, whereas real neurons use spikes. Now, some people would say this is not this is not a problem. Um, we, you know, most people assume that floating point numbers, the activation levels, are re representing the firing rates of the neurons, so we don't have to worry about the spikes, right? But I think that's completely wrong. Um, floating point mass is incredibly expensive. It's uh, and actually, uh, if you build it on rate coding, that's a disaster too. It's just simply not um, not viable. Backprop learning, it works, but it's 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 horrendously uh, slow relative to what how the way humans work. So, in a sense, to, as a caricature, a sort of standard neural network here with 16 neurons, 
as inputs and, and wander around here with different weights and so on. It's basically saying that you've got floating point numbers for the reactivation levels, floating point values for the weights. You multiply these things together to get a sort of activation level. Uh, you sum them all together and you feed them through some output function, which could be a sigmoid or a rectified uh, linear unit like this sort of thing. But if, if that was the way that the brain really worked, uh, there's a killer argument, which I think would just you know, mean that you could never simulate something like the brain that way. We know that the brain's got 86 billion neurons uh, and you know, let's say 7,000 synapses per neuron on average. And if you wanted to recalculate the state of all those neurons with one millisecond precision, which is what neurophysiologists would like, you can calculate the number of flops you would need. It's 600 petaflops. 86 billion times at 7,000 times 1,000, et cetera. Now, the most powerful com computer on the planet can currently only manage 500 uh, petaflops. Um, it's the supercomputer uh, in uh, Recon, um, uh, but it's using 30 megawatts. Now, that's, that's 1.5 million times more any energy uh, 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 expensive than, than the human brain, which only uses 20 watts. So why is the brain so efficient? One possibility that some people are thinking about, including people at, um, at IMEC, is using in-memory computing rather than having to shift data back and forwards. So that, and that could well be a, a key. Uh, but the other key, I think, is using spikes. And so the, the mainstream view is that, um, and I think this dominates 99.9% .9 of all research, basically, is that spikes are being used to implement rate coding. There are various ways you can do that. Um, standard rate coding is where you just simply count the number of spikes generated in a given time, let's say 10 milliseconds. You can use other things like measuring the interval between spikes or population rate coding or, or some sort of label line coding or, or, or Poisson rate coding, which is supposed to be bio plausible. But uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, but, but they basically, believe me, these are all incredibly inefficient. So very, very, these various types of coding, which I've just sort of schematized here, this is where count-based coding, you've got your 16 neurons here, and they're, and they're generating different numbers of spikes in the same window. Uh, you could use interspike interval, but you know the problem's reading this out. I won't go into the, into the details, but none of this is really very good because it's a perfectly good alternative. It's called temporal coding. It's the idea that you can you do processing with a wave of spikes <coughs> in which the, you know, you've got input activation profile. You've got these neurons and they're generating spikes in an order where the most strongly activated cells fire first. So you can use the order of firing as a code. And this, this simply follows on from a basic neurophysiological um, fact that if you've got a sensory receptor, for instance, uh, the ganglion cells in the retina, uh, they've got a threshold. And if you put a, a, a weak stimulus, the time taken for the neuron to reach threshold is relatively long, increases the intensity and the neuron fires earlier. This is basic neuro neurophysiology. And it produces this sort of intensity latency function. As you increase the intensity, the latency drops. Uh, in the end, it's not drop, dropping very much because it's sort of saturated. But this is a, a very different idea. This is using sensory neurons as intensity to delay converters rather than the conventional view, which sees neurons as intensity to rate converters. And you can see this actually in that figure here. Where, sorry, uh, I've, I've, I've gone through. I'll go, uh, 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 what I'd like to point out is this idea was already known with the very first studies of neurons in the 1920s by Lord a a Edgar Adrian in Cambridge. He got the Nobel Prize for this. This is the first ever study of uh, firing patterns in, in the optic nerve of the eel, actually. Um, he was able to record uh, the rate of firing of a bunch of fibres uh, with two intensity stimuli. The stimuli came on for 300 milliseconds, and you can see the fire, firing rate here plotted as a function of time. Now, you've got two intensities, high and, and low, and you can see that the, the, the higher intensity stimulus produces more firing. It's a higher firing rate, and particularly the maintained firing rate is much higher for the higher intensity stimulus. Great, that's the rate coding. But look, the latency of the onset it's completely different. It's like twice as long with the low intensity stimulus. That was already visible in the very first study ever done. 
Um, and it showed that the retina is an intensity delay converter. And that basic physiological fact has essentially been ignored by just about everybody, including neurophysiologists, but in particular modelers. And that's been ignored for 60 years or more. I just want to mention a, another a study that we did back in 1993, where we were flashing gratings, really boring uh, stimuli. Simon, just can to... you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we cannot hear you for some reason. We can. We can't. We just... Yeah, yeah I'm hearing very well, to be honest. Can it be a uh, local thing? Maybe you can unmute. You are not I'm, muted, but... I'm not muted, and some people can hear me, so that's very you, odd. You, you I can also hear you very well. Okay. Or probably the room can hear us. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think I should keep going. I should keep going, uh, uh, I think, probably. Um, no, I can't no, do it. Not not yeah. Well, it's, it's very unfortunate if you've not been able to hear me. Um, anyway, the, you, can, you can follow the figures, hopefully. This is, this is flashing grating. Gratings, those boring stimulus ever used by neurophysiologists. And the grating comes on for 300 milliseconds. And you can, we're, we've got presentations of six presentations of each orientation and a whole bunch of different orientations. And you can see here that the, the latency of the neuron sort of actually is not fixed. As you move away from its preferred orientation, the neuron takes longer to fire. So again, this is showing that actually it's not just the luminance or the contrast. It, any, any parameter that you want to code with a neuron actually gets transformed into the timing domain. Again, this has been ignored by most people. Let's, okay, so let's, um, let's, uh, Imagine now that we've got our input profile here and we're going to make our neurons fire, but in an order. OK, what could you do with that? Well, um, here we've got a neuron with different weights here from a large weight here to a minimum weight here. Normally, that neuron would not care what order these inputs fire in. But all you have to do is to add a shunting inhibition circuit, which as spikes come in, they turns down the sensitivity of this neuron. And if you sort of desensitize by 15% on every time a neuron spikes, you can get this sort of um, activation function here. As spikes come in, if you hit the neurons in the order of their weights, you reach this maximum value because the first, the first weight is 100% is effective, the second 85% corrected, uh, effective and so on. If you activate the neurons in the reverse uh, uh, alphabetical order. That's the worst thing you could do. And if you take random values uh, between the two, you get something in between. Uh, and we call that rank order coding. Um, you get maximum activation when the inputs arrive in the order of the weights. Uh, minimum activity with the reverse order. Now, the <laughs> amazing thing is, with just 16 inputs like here, there are 16 factorial orders. That's 21 trillion. Um, you could, in principle, have 21 trillion different neurons, each with a different set of weights, and they would be able to code every single ordering possible. But it, the various problems with that, one is you need very accurate weight control. And in fact, it's, uh, we never managed to come up with a learning rule that could fix the intermediate weights. Everything always saturated. You either got um, um, weights of one or, or zero. And so we've been thinking for a long time about what happens if you only have binary weights. Don't forget about these things. Here. Just, let's just have binary weights. Well, what you can do is uh, what's been called N of M coding. Here we've got our neurons again. They're firing these spikes, one spike each, uh, late, intensity late, latency conversion. Most active end inputs fire first, and they generate this sequence of spikes. Now, um, if you um, were to put a set of relay cells but this time we're going to have a, a feedback inhibition, which basically counts up the number of inputs that have fired so far and then blocks anybody firing afterwards. So you let through a fixed number of spikes. That's effectively a temporal winner take all circuit, a KWTA. We're just, we're just going to let uh, four spikes out of 16 go through. You can actually do the same thing directly on the input. You can have the, the inhibitory circuit affecting the input neurons here. Uh, so we don't even get the other 12 spikes. It's just the first four neurons are allowed to fire. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, if you only allow for uh, um, n out of m, where n is the number of spiking spikes allowed through out of m possibilities, um, this is a trick that we used in SpikeNet Technologies recognition engine that we developed. SpikeNet Technology was a company I set up in 1999 with my students, and we and we worked out how to use this in 20, uh, 2001 to four. But we never published it, unfortunately, because it was the secret source that the company was using. It turned out that uh, somebody else. Uh, who's well known, Steve Ferber, who is the guy behind uh, Spinnaker, um, also noticed the same thing in 2004. So I'm quite happily to to call this N of M coding as he did. So it's independently developed. Um, now, if you um, if you imagine that we're just going to let through a fixed number of neurons, and uh, let's suppose that we got here, we've got a bunch of neurons, each with a fixed number of binary weights. Here we've chosen four. You can see that um, you can actually calculate uh, how many hits you would expect by chance. Here we've got 16 inputs, um, four of them are active. We've set things up so, um, so each neuron has W uh, weights, four. Uh, and you can calculate the number of hits here for an, a random pattern coming in and most of the time you're going to get one sometimes two occasionally three and one in a thousand times you get four hits so that allows you to make uh, actually quite select selective neurons this neuron here will actually like any any sequence that starts with uh, j k c and b in that in whatever order so this is likes o m d h this one likes p l c g and this one likes um K, M, O, and A. Actually, it doesn't know what the ordering is. It could be Mako, it could be a mock, uh, et cetera. It, 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 but, it, but it's still doing a pretty good job. And you can calculate for any size network um, how many hits you'd expect using the hypergeometric distribution. So here we're varying the number of inputs and fixing the num uh, number of spikes and weights at four. And you can see that, well, we were just talking about this case where it's 0.05% probability of getting four hits uh, uh, with a random input. But you can play this game uh, by varying, for instance, the here we've got 10% of the inputs firing all the time. Uh, they're probably getting with 100 inputs and uh, only 10 of which are active and 10 weights. Probably getting seven hits is already very low, and the probability of getting 10 hits is absolutely astronomically small. And this allows you to make very selective neurons that are very unlikely to fire with random inputs. Um, and OK, I, I think it's probably worth pointing out that the more neurons you've got, the better this works. So here we've got a billion neurons, and we're just going to let some percentage of them fire. And we've got neurons that are listening in on this with only a small number of weights. And the probabilities of getting up to the threshold for firing are, are, are extremely low. Um, uh, you know, uh, even even when 10 percent of the neurons fire, there's only sort of a, a tiny probability of getting uh, of any given neuron reaching threshold. Um, now, if you actually set this up as a recurrent network, so we take our billion neurons and we feed them back into each other, in, uh, onto themselves, um, you can actually calculate the number of expected spikes as a function of the density of spiking in the activity. Here, out of the billion neurons, you only expect two neurons to fire, even when around less than, a bit less than 1% of the neurons are firing at random. But of course, if they're not random, then the system becomes incredibly selective because any of these neurons could fire if they get their right hits. So as I say, with less than 1% of active neurons, um, very few uh, neurons fire by chance. Now, <clears throat> I've been talking rather abstractly, but let, let me just go back. Do you remember when I was showing you how good we are at detecting a face out in the middle of the, uh, the uh, off the, well off the uh, the center of the uh, of the uh, of vision? How could that be possible? Well, it, I reckon <coughs> that you can do this with a very cheap mechanism. Imagine that you've got a bunch of actually eighteen different oriented filters. I've just got horizontal and vertical in eight in nine different positions. There are eighteen neurons here. And let's suppose that for a given pattern, the first ones to fire are these four. Well, those four actually correspond to those four orientations here. And so this neuron here, which will fire, 
was, is, a, is a perfectly good way of saying it's a face. The key is to say, don't let all the neurons get through, only let the first four. And then you can make a really cheap, really effective face detector that can work with very little information. Because the fact is that, you know, you know uh, this looks like a face to everybody, right? And it's got four lines in it. And yet that, that will trigger your face detector uh, because that's uh, very good. So, N of N coding um, is very powerful. The question is, can we make neurons learn to respond to patterns? Um, you know, here we got a, uh, we, we would like to be able to produce a neuron that actually learns to respond to a particular thing. And this is where uh, an idea that we developed with Amir, who's here with you today, we call it JAST, uh, basically because Jake, Amir, Simon and Tim were the inventors of this thing. We did this back in, um, in 2016. The trick is to have neurons that have two thresholds. So you've got a, uh, neurons that start with a random pattern of connections. You've got two thresholds, a threshold for spiking, which might be four, <coughs> but a second lower threshold for learning. So for this particular input, this neuron has got two hits. That's already a bit suspicious. So we could trigger the learning mechanism, which would say, if you ex if you get to two, move one of your unused weights, this one here, to a place where one of the inputs was active. So you move it here, um, so that now if the same pattern of inputs come in comes in, you'll now get three hits. You could have moved up your learning threshold now to three, such that <coughs> here we. Um, we get to the learning threshold again, and we again will move a weight to now have a neuron which uh, will fire if that particular pattern uh, occurred. And we only need two repeats to get it to learn that. Now, back in um, 2015, when Amir was visiting the lab, uh, we managed to show that this is, this. Uh, I was showing you the case with 16 inputs and, and neurons with four weights. Well, um, here we've got 124 input neurons and 124 output neurons, each with a small number of weights. The inputs are initially firing at random. And at some point, we uh, we arbitrarily choose any spike as being the beginning of a motif that we're going to repeat. And then we take one in every two spikes, the blue spikes here, are going to be a pattern that repeats. And you can see that the first time that pattern occurs, nothing happens on the output for the obvious reason. It's exactly, we haven't done anything at all. But as soon as you start repeating things, so this is the second repeat where you've got the blue spikes are the same, but mixed in with 50% of, of random spikes. Well, you can see here, we've got two new out of the output neurons have already learned to, uh, to respond because they shifted their weights around. And by the time we've had six repeats, we've got a whole pile of these neurons firing. And we can do this simultaneously with, with m multiple patterns. Here's some, there are red neurons and, and blue neurons simultaneously learning, and this works really fast. Um, and uh, uh, we were doing this on an FP FPGA. So this is Amir's implementation. Doing this on a Spartan Six cost about this is the Spartan Six cost us a hundred dollars or so, and we were feeding into it. You no. Know, tens of thousands of spikes coming in. The, uh, initially, these are just random spikes. Then we got these little motifs, the blue and the red ones are firing. During those repeating patterns, the neurons are becoming selective. You switch back to the uh, random patterns and the neurons stop firing. Come back with the, the, the things that have been repeated and the neurons immediately respond. Um, amazingly, this took this whole thing only took uh, 14 uh, milliseconds actually here was longer but if, if you run the if the run the fpga flat out we could get the whole learning and unlearning and all the rest of it and testing it was 13 milliseconds on the spartan 6. now we got that we've submitted patents for that um uh and basically the the, the bottom line if if you like is that spiking neurons if you're using intensity delay conver uh, conversions, you can get information in the order of firing and you use in inhibitory circuits to control the percentage of active neurons. You can use binary synapses, N of M coding, and a JAST learning rule to match weights to fit things in impact incoming patterns that repeat. And as I say, two to three, five repeats is typically enough for learning. So can we scale up those ideas for energy efficient AI? Well, just a quick 
summary just to say where we are now. Conventional neural networks, we're using floating point numbers and uh, for the activations of the weights and so on. You might do this with event-driven processing uh, with spikes, but it's still using floating point numbers. What we're talking about now is binary uh, event-driven processing and even better, binary with um, N of M coding. So these sort of things are, are going to be very expensive because they're using floating point numbers. These are much more efficient because you literally only, uh, for each of the output neurons, you just simply have to increment their activation levels. No multiplication necessary at all. It's not even addition, it's just increment. And if you control the sparsity and you use the JAST learning rule, you can you can make this, in, I think, into very big systems. And this is what I call the Terabane Brain Project, which I'm doing with some various researchers at the IRIT, uh, Institute for Research in Informatic in Toulouse. And our aim is to try and use existing hardware to scale up these ideas. Um, and one of the sort of things that we'd like to do is is doing sort of reasoning. Uh, if I ask the question, which composer born in 1756? Now, if you know if you know your history, that might be enough for you to say Mozart, because Mozart was a composer born in, born in 1756. You could do that in a very simple spiking neural network where you have inputs coding particular symbols and neurons here uh, with different binary weights. If you have if you have uh, uh, composer uh, born 1756, then you get over threshold for firing that neuron and so forth. And you can actually do any any sorts of architecture you like here um, with sensory neurons connected to neurons in the system. You can have recurrent neurons, you can control output neurons and so on. You can do any architecture you like. And you should we believe we can move up to billions of neurons doing this. A couple of important ideas. One is that we're using um, a different approach to what is used in conventional neural networks, where effectively you use lists of backward connections. That's say, for each neuron in the system, you recalculate its state of act activation using its list of inputs and their activation levels and weights. <clears throat> but what we've been doing actually for nearly 30 years is using a list of forward connections. Here we uh, so each spike updates the activation of its all, its all of its targets. Now, SpikeNet was actually perhaps one of the very first um, systems to do this. So this was Arno Delorme's code. This is back in 1999. And we were already doing face detection, very much as I was explaining just now, you know, looking for particular combinations of orientation uh, activity. And I used to joke at the time that um, and this is, that's why we created SpikeNet technology. I used to joke that you could you could use SpikeNet to simulate the entire human brain in real time, if none of the neurons fire. And that's the trick, really. Uh, we don't calculate every neuron all the time. We just update neurons that are active. Another trick is to uh, choose between sequential activation propagation, where each spike as it comes in is propagated one by one. Um, or you can do it by blocks. You can you can you can group together a bunch of spikes and then process those together. Um, in other words, you're using packets, and that's exactly what I was talking about with N of M coding. You just let a certain number of neurons fire, and then you process them as a block. Now, with uh, a student last year, uh, the Iri, he was you know, he was using a, a top of the range uh, GPU. And he tried all sorts of different ways of doing connections, either backward or forward or sequential by block. And we could have learning going on or not. And he tried CPUs and GPUs and so on. The bottom line is that the best way to do things, if you want the best, uh, is, uh, is to use the GPU with forward connections and block based processing. Because under those conditions, we were able to stimulate the network with a billion neurons and 100 million inputs. Uh, each neuron had four connections, which is very low, but that's still four billion connections to worry about. And we could process a block of a million spikes in 18 milliseconds. That's phenomenal. Uh, Two billion updates every second. And, and there's no reason why we couldn't extend this to much larger networks with more con with recurrent connections and online jazz. And I hope, hopefully we'll be able to use this in various things like image processing, but also perhaps natural language processing, doing things like storing information about which composer was born in 1756 and so on.
And that could be an alternative to things like GPT-3. Um, just to stress the point, if you know, I, I was just talking about a, an array which actually has 100 million inputs and 100 billion outputs. If you wanted to implement that as a, a crossbar array physically, we'd be talking about 100 million billion synapses. And you couldn't simulate that using standard methods, really. Uh, and and you, you, you would be impossible to do a, a, hard, a crossbar array to do that. But we believe that we can we, we can do this by talking about very sparse activity. And so one of the sort of things that we're going to try, uh, I've got a student starting up on this, is rather than using GPUs, how about using uh, Apple's M1 chips? Um, the latest one, which has come out in the Mac Studio, the M1 Ultra, it's got like 114 billion transistors. It's got 128 gigabytes of unified memory that can be addressed from everywhere. Lots of memory, lots of cores and so on. And you can have inexpensive memory models with you know two, four terabytes uh, that are really fast as well. So what we're planning to do is to use the main memory, that 126, 128 gigabytes to implement the neurons and implement the connections, the list of connections using uh, uh, these solid state disk things. And I honestly think that we're going to be able to do uh, terabrain, that's a trillions of neurons, you know, uh, real any any time soon. But let me just go back to that other idea, packet based computation. This is the idea that you don't process. Uh, the, this is a, a block of a block of spikes of process at once. So here we are effectively load in a, a set of uh, binary weights, you read in a set of input spikes, and effectively the main operation is to do a match. You count the number of hits, the number of um, places where there's a spike and a binary weight, and then you have a counter pipeline to count the number of hits. Um, and then you load in another set of weights and you get a different count, another set of weights and so on. And that's precisely, oh, oh and if you get four hits, for instance, that's when you spike the neuron. That's exactly what Amir was doing in 2015 on his Spartan 6. There he was using 1,024 inputs, actually up to 4,000 outputs, because the chip has four megabits of memory. But uh, in collaboration, I mean, what I'm excited about, what I'd hope to be with you today was we're, one of the things we're doing is te testing with a much larger FPGA. Um, uh, uh, this is, um, um, what, so let me just uh, run through, I've got the picture. The, 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 this, I'm doing this with Amir, but also Manolis and Alexandra. Uh, we've got a large FPGA that's already available. And the question is, what can we do with eight gigabytes of on-chip memory? But the other thing is, and this is a, a speciality I understand at IMEC, is in-memory computing, because that basic AND operation, where you load in the weight, you load in the spikes, and you just do an AND, and then count how many set, how many bits you get that are set. That can be potentially done in memory. And you could do take a million inputs, a million weights, and if they're really sparse, the number of um, hits is going to be so low that you can use the current that's being generated in the memory chip to answer the question, how many hits do I get? And in one clock cycle, you could potentially do what is effectively a massive computation. And if that's all you have to do, then we can really go for very low uh, energy uh, devices. So, um, Hardware-friendly AI algorithms. Here are the, the take-home messages. One is don't use floating-point numbers. Uh, don't use them for activation levels and don't use them for weights. Use spikes. Use binary weights if, if you can. Don't use rate coding. Very bad idea. Use temporal coding. Fix the percentage of neurons that spike, which is effectively what we're doing with N of M coding. Don't use backward lists of the inputs to each neuron because that's a waste of time. Just use forward lists to connect, to uh, process the connection of the outputs for each neuron. And essentially that's using event-driven computing. And if you want to get the best out of a GPU, you process a block of spikes and then just check to see which neurons have reached threshold, which could be done as a separate step, step actually. So there's no need to implement synapses as physical uh, devices using crossbar arrays. And simulating neural networks the size of the human brain or larger 
can be possible real soon now, I think. So with that, I will stop and stop sharing my screen. And I hope that um, uh, bu -bu -bu. So sorry, guys, for the, those of you who couldn't hear me, what, what happened in the end? No, 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 we solved the issue very fast. It was okay. from our okay. side. So okay, so I managed people, to finish. Yeah, there are people who uh, want to ask questions. I see Yao Hong, uh, you raise your hand, so please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, very nice uh, talk, I, I like it a lot. Uh, uh, you, you talk about the one slide about this uh, packet base, uh, uh, can you uh, explain a bit more and how does it compare with a uh, uh, more conventional approach? What okay, was the okay. So, so um, there are two. I was explaining. I was a bit rushed at the end. I was trying to leave some time for question. Um, if you got if you got a list of spikes coming in uh, from a device, it could be a, 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 a dynamic vision sensor or anything. Actually, I don't, it doesn't really matter. You've got this ordered list of spikes, and one thing you could do is to process each spike one by one. Uh, that works. It's great. It has the advantage, actually, that when a neuron goes over threshold, you know precisely when it fired relative to the inputs, and that's actually important for learning. But if you want to use hardware efficiently, either on a GPU or with in-memory computing, uh, what you want to do is to uh, read in a whole bunch of spikes and make a packet. So this is the idea of N of M. You've got you know, a million inputs, and you let them... Uh, you read in spikes until you've got some percentage of them are at set. That gives you a sort of binary vector with, you know, 100 bits set out of a million. And then either you can just send that, send that packet to a GPU and have, a, you know, 10,000 cores all processing uh, in parallel. And that's very efficient. That's how we managed to get you know, a million spikes processed in, in 18 milliseconds. But you've lost, you don't know when the neurons fired. Um, in that sequence, okay. So uh, that's why you might need a two two phase thing. First, uh, you do your packet spike uh, thing, and then for the neurons that reach threshold, of which you may only have like a handful, you then manually go back and read the spikes in again and say, ah, this one fired after spike number three thousand, and then uh, and so by doing it in two phases you can get the best of both worlds. So the in-memory computing won't tell you exactly which neuron fired when, but it will tell you, you know, uh, uh, um, that these neurons fired, and then you would just have a second phase to do that. Well, one of the things about the FPGAs that we've got is that you can, you've got a CPU core on, on it you can, you, that you could use for doing the, the, uh, the sequential propagation once you know which cells, uh, neurons are interesting. So hopefully that was that was clear. Basically, the 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 point is packet-based processing, which is what Amir did in 2015 on the FPGA, is incredibly efficient. We were doing you know one neuron update every you know at 100 megahertz. It was you know really really very impressive. Um, but you you don't have the temporal precision of knowing when it during the the, the packet the, the neuron fired. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so uh, I see Yang Yu. Uh... Yes, uh, my question is about uh, the binary weights. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this just zero or one, or could you also encode them as minus one and plus one? And does that make a difference? Um, uh, the big question there. So some people think uh, actually for hardware, you need three state um, um, weights. Uh, I would say, no, you don't need three states. You just need two lists. One is a list of plus one, and another one is a list of minus one. And when you're processing the plus one, you increment, and when you're processing the minus one, you decrement. And that's fine, and it's uh, it's it's a, a very sensible thing. Actually, when I was doing the N of M thing of, uh, of blocking the neurons, um, it's effectively using negative weights. Uh, you're, you're sort of... Um, but I would not use hardware with three state synapses because that means you're doing an awful lot of zeros and you don't <laughs> want to do zeros. So yeah, yes, fine with pluses and minuses, but no zeros, please. Very bad <laughs> idea. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. Hello, 
Simon. Thanks Hi. for the nice talk. Uh, I'm not an expertise in uh, spike neural networks, but once I read a paper about the hardware implementation, it says the learning of the spike neural network is uh, hard work. They use the, it's called STDP, it's spike yeah. time dependent plasticity. I wonder yeah. what's the difference between these two things. Okay, so um, I, I actually cut out a large section. Normally I talk about STDP a lot. It's STDP is a learning rule for synapse, which is a, which are continuously variable. So, um, uh, you know, and we did a lot of that to start with, but uh, I mentioned very briefly that when we tried to have a, a learning rule that was stable, that would fix the, the weight at 0.5, we never managed to do it because it would always saturate. It would either go to one or down to zero. And that's why we were look, we've were we been looking at uh, binary weight systems. Now, it's actually another type of STDP. It's spike time dependent plasticity. It just is a, an, an STDP rule, but only uses binary connections. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of STDP. Uh, but I, I gave you the short version in which I say, yeah, everybody else is using continuous values and it works, you know, and uh, the trouble is it's not stable um, and you uh, and you lose that uh, wonderful thing about N of M coding where you know precisely what the sum of the weights is. So, uh, you know, if I've got one of my neurons got four weights, it never changes. All it ever does is move the weights around. And so that's very easy. If you've got an STDP rule that says, oh, if I increase this one by 0.1, what do I do with the other ones? Do I do decrease them all by a fixed amount or do I just move? You know, it gets a mess. So uh, STDP, yes. Uh, but I'm trying to encourage you to think binary uh, for the weights rather than continuous. Okay, thank you very much. You mentioned that STDP is a, that's a, like a floating point version, and it would have a lot of complexity about it. Exactly. But what's so the performance you... of this too? I mean, in which condition ah. would, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, so that's another, that's another thing that I, I could have included. Um, STDP, we, um, Tim Maskelly, um, uh, who co-supervised Amir's thesis, by the way, when he was doing his thesis with, with me, we, we were looking at using STDP as a way of finding repeating patterns, and it works. It's just relatively long. It takes tens of, a minimum of, you know, several tens of repetitions to get the neuron to learn. You could, you know, get neurons to learn to respond to faces or motorcycles or whatever. It works. The trouble is, I know for a fact that the human brain is much faster than that. We only need yeah. two or two to five repeats. If you're using continuously variable synapses, you can't make learning far, uh, fast enough. And so the STDP rule that we're using, where you have only binary weights and we just move them rather than uh, adjusting them individually, uh, has this amazing ability to find things that repeat. That, that, that's what we saw uh, with Amir's simulations on the on the FPGA, you know, in 2015. It just, you know, it finds on the second repeat, you've already got neurons that are saying, oh, I've seen that before, which is absolutely extraordinary. But it's actually what human brains do. Uh, I, I, I won't bore you with the details, but we've done experiments showing that, for instance, if you if you stream image net images at 120 frames a second, you're watching this on the screen and they're all different, except there's one that repeats. Magically, you notice the one that repeats quite how you're doing it. I mean, there's no way you're remembering 120 frames every second, but the, the synapses apparently are able to spot this. Um, that's another talk. I was supposed to be giving that talk at uh, in uh, the Donders Institute, but I missed. Uh, I wasn't able to do that either. But but basically, that, that's the that's the challenge. How do you make a system that can pick up repeats in two to five repeats? I my claim is you can only do that with binary synapses. Thank you very much. Can I go next? Um, Please so, do. Yeah. Yes, Thank Lee. Thank you for a very inspiring and passionate talk. Um, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I have the impression you're focusing like on, on big compute central brain. Would your story change if we would go to peripheral nerve, if we go to distributed compute? 
uh, yeah, but, but maybe additional challenges or, or yeah, other opportunities may arise if we talk about. In fact, in Eindhoven, we focus on a neuromorphic sensing program. In, in AMIC, we focus mm -hmm. on a neuromorphic sensing program. So not on, on a neuromorphic compute program. Yeah. What would change? Uh, what would have different priorities? Um, for me, not, nothing. I, 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 I like talking about the, the trillion neuron system because it you know, makes me sort of excited. But actually, you can do this right on the periphery. So, um, you know, I, I was showing that uh, example of um, you know, processing, uh, finding faces in little images. Well, you can do that. <coughs> in fact, that's one of the things that we're doing with Amir and Manalis and, and Alex um, is taking images. And then uh, actually what we do is we do uh, some very simple convolutions, four, four uh, convolutions, and then pick off the most active convolutions. And that gives it, that's already doing the N of M trick. So we know that at each pixel, you only have a uh, one, one of a different set of uh, filters active. And then you do the same trick. And so we can do things like finding faces or in fact, anything you like in an image in straight off the, the, uh, off the input layer. So no, this is not just for you know, the inside of a really, really big system. It's great for you know, peripheral devices and it, it would work with image data or auditory data or vibration data or anything you like. You just convert it into spikes and look at the ordering. So you're saying that the algorithms are not changing, but would the hardware or the hardware architecture be impacted? Not really, no. Uh, in fact, um, so um, Brainchip, uh, with whom I, I have been associated, um, have a chip called Akida, which uh, they've got a, they've actually got a, a sort of license to use Jast on it, um, and it's got um, it's got 1.2 million neurons on it potentially, and it can be you can wire it up with any device you like, including uh, sort of DVS uh, cameras. But also they're using it for all factory processing and, and things like this. And it's really just a question of the what you want. You've got this chip, which only costs like, you know, it's a seven millimeter ASIC, uh, which costs like twenty dollars to build. <clears throat> and you can send it any any data you like. As I say, it could be auditory stuff or video or whatever. So you change the device that's sending the spikes. But no, it doesn't change the okay. the chip doesn't change at all because it, it, all it's interested in is the number of the of the input device that fired a, a, a spike. So your hardware doesn't change at all. What okay. changes is is the device that's sending the spikes. Thanks, and hope we can still welcome you uh, in our offices uh, at another occasion. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, so not sure if anybody else has a question. Uh, if not, uh, we are right on time, one. So uh, we would like to thank you, Simon, uh, for the nice presentation. And probably we will have some follow-up meetings, uh, but uh, like we have know. next week the usual. But ah, the follow-up meetings we they were mostly cancelled. I think it's better when you come. Yeah, the invitation yeah. still holds. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Um, so the question is, uh, um, uh, how soon? Obviously, I, I will presumably not be COVID positive uh, tomorrow or something. Um, um, I've got a, some other meetings I'm supposed to do, um, including going 